Uh, years ago, we started doing this in 1982, and it just grew and grew and grew. Uh, back, we would normally do eight sets of triples, all right? And the weights was 40% back then, but we were so slow. So nowadays, guys aren't so slow, so I actually recommend most people can use 50%. 50% of your, of your raw max and do the eight triples. And uh, Bill Kazmaier, like myself, but I didn't know, uh, used three different grips. Basically, three grips with the index finger on the, touching the smooth, then three sets with the thumb touching the, the smooth, and then three sets with the, in, the little finger touching the ring. This all involves a lot of tricep, uh, and that's what's going to bend you in the end anyhow, so you get immediate tricep development while you're doing your speed sets. Um, to keep the rest between, when you're doing um, eight triples, keep the rest between 60 and 90 seconds. Uh, for, you, you could go much faster if you want, but if you start to slow down, you have to, it doesn't make any sense because you're trying to develop a fast rate of force development. The dynamic day, by science, says it will not make you stronger. It is for a fast rate of force development. But everything is like a tr car. Uh, every gear has a purpose. First gear, second gear, third gear, and so forth. So I believe that the dynamic way has a great influence on strength. George Habert um, broke probably 14 world records in shirts, but also a raw bench 550 at 198 in a meet and touch and go to 625 at 235. And uh, he believed that the speed work was the most important thing. You know, it's one thing to be strong, it's another to display it. You had to be able to display it. Um, so um, keep the rest up there. Now, we have uh, other alternatives as well. Many times we'll do to raise volume outside, away from the meet, we will do uh, six by six, six sets of six. And they'll do six sets of six for a while. And then they, uh, when you, uh, let's say you end up doing, you're using 275 and you figure the next week you can't get any more. Start back over eight sets of eight. So you know, if you start at 250, you'll probably go down to 225. But then you'll roll up through the weeks till you can't do eight sets of eight anymore. Then go to 10 sets of 10. Um, now the weight's going to, the beginning will be even lighter, but the, but the volume goes way up. You, you're talking at 100 reps now. You're going from, um, you know, uh, like 64 reps. You know, originally it was 24 reps, then it was 36, then it was 64, and then 100. And, and then maybe when the contest gets close, roll back to the eight sets of triple where you're really working on a fast rate of force development. So you're replacing that day, the speed day, with the rep day? It can be replaced. Uh, we have a 165 pounder here. It's the number one in the country at uh, 1880. In, in nine months, he's done 2005. Uh, but his bench has gone officially from 515 to 580 by using this very same program. A uh, little girl I have, 123, uh, she had a 190-pound bench on the very same process. Uh, in a meet, she's done 270. Uh, and this is inside a year. So, so there's, there's a lot of people need muscle mass, especially women <clears throat> or beginner lifters. You know, the most important thing is, is, is strength, maximal strength, uh, because, you know, the first thing you got to be strong before you work on speed. All right. So here you build a lot of uh, muscle mass, hypertrophy work built in. And so when you get a, when you can't get a six set mm -hmm. of six, you'll go back down to the original weight. You jump, you just eight? go back to eight, but you have to start a little bit lighter. Okay. Are you be switching grips on that? Is that the same grip the uh, whole time? Or you most of the people here, glad you brought that up. Uh, most of them are wide grips, wide and illegal. Um, I was this is brought to I had a three forty bench way back in the early 70s, at a massive body weight of 170. And I asked Bill Sino how to bench. And this guy had won six best chess awards in Mr. America's. And, uh, and at the time, he's American record holder in a bench before world record and so forth. But Bill grabbed me and he scared the hell out of me, man. This guy was jacked up. And he's grabbed me all over and he goes, you need to use illegal grip. And I said, I don't know anything about it. I just know he could bench. And so he says, you use illegal go inch outside the ring. It's the way I was built. And told me to do this very program. Although um, I never really liked it, the eights and the tens. I mostly did the sixes. I'd work it up, then I'd just do max effort work, go back to the sixes. But anyhow, it took my raw bench um, from 1972 to 1977 uh, from 340 to uh, 515. I did 500 at one, one, 197 body weight. So this would work raw or geared? Yeah, there was no shirts. Yep. You know, and we'll get into that controversy, but I was top 10 bencher without shirts and with shirts. So it doesn't matter. You know, you got to have a brain in your head. So when would you rotate this in? Like, does it go by feel or when is the optimal time to... Uh, uh, I'd like to do it, Tommy, after a meet and then, you know, leading up maybe, you know, four or five weeks before the next meet. 
Uh, Greg Panora, you know, world record holder in a total several times when he trained here, he also would do this program. And he also used 10 pound ankle weights on his wrist. <laughs> so we put 10 pound ankle weights on the wrist while he did all the speed work. And then close, then we'd take the ankle weights off, drop the reps, super, because he was monstrously strong, but not real fast, kind of like uh, Wesley. And if you weren't a lifter, you don't have a meet um, for athletes, does it matter? Just You just bring it in every so often? Just run through a hyperbity phase. Yeah. You, know, you might want to do this 8, 10, 12 weeks. I don't know. You know, you might do three weeks of six, three weeks of eight. You just, you know, everybody's got their own way. And, you know, your way is the best way, normally. You know, don't do something you don't want to do because it's just not going to work. You know, so, um, and um, so like I said, you know, the, the ultra high reps, most of them stay wide and then we'll get into it, but a lot more tricep work. When you're, when you're doing dynamic work as well, you must use change of bands. You must use accommodating resistance because the weight's like 50%. At the very top, you're going to accelerate so fast, you are not producing any force. You have deceleration because of weight's like. So you want to use chains. Um, most, you know, you could, uh, I've seen people run waves a three week wave, one chain, the second week, two chain, the third week, three chain. I've seen them go, um, <clears throat> many, you know, they could go for two set of chain and then into mini bands for two or three weeks, then into monsters for two or three weeks. And one of my favorite things, um, I would train with uh, around 285 for my sets doing triples. I use two set of chain and I use a choke, a monster. Now, the way we do it, um, uh, like the mini bands in our gym is set up around a 4x4 four four, about an inch off the ground gives you 85 pounds. Monsters, when they're double looped, 125. And I think choked, I don't know time, you could tell me you're a little longer than I am. But I, I probably gives me uh, maybe 25, 30 at the extra top right where people can't rock out. So it teaches you constant acceleration. And you can use bands and chains. Like I said, that's what I, I was my favorite when I, when I trained. And the percent on the bar was what? Uh, nowadays I would use 50 because way back in the earth, everybody was super strong but not very fast all right and so the, in the 70s and 80s before ventures you had to be strong i mean these guys there's a few strong guys out there there were many strong guys out there years ago i watched larry pacific go bench 530 and total 1900 1972 and the 198 where there was two hour win not 24 and then eight weeks later weighing 228 in the meet that we were in i spotted him while he benched 590 weighing 228 so this is one strong ass guy, you know, and um, at the time there was only maybe six people who could bench over six hundred. So Larry was way ahead of his time back then, and uh, Larry told me seventy five percent of your bench is triceps, and I've always believed that. You know, everybody works on their pecs, which is important. I think are stabilizers, but the pecs. Why is the pec deck made like this? You know, you, when you lock out like that. So it's the arms, arms and upper back, but. Um, how we do it? Any more questions there on, on um, bands? First of all, how do you select the correct resistance, and how do you hook up bands to a bar? And finally, how do you know what resistance is on the end of bands? One question at a time here. <laughs> I'm my attorney. Um, well, we hook up the bands, like I said, around a four by four inch off the ground, and that's why we arrive at our weight. How do we arrive at our weight? We stand on a scale, pick up double band, stand it up, and see what it weighs to track your body weight and double the bands. That's how we do it. You want to make sure you got tension in the bottom, for God's sake. If you don't have tension in the bottom, you're going to use too much momentum out of the bottom. And you don't want momentum, you want constant tension through almost like a, a variable resistance like um, a nice kinetic device would have. So the band weight, you would base that off of what? what weight oh, you want that to be? well, Tommy asked me the percentage. It's basically mm -hmm. around 30%. So you see, if you use 50, I'm asking you to use... <clears throat> And there's reasons why all these things. Um, you know, we use 50% bar weight, 30% band tension. That equates to 80% of the top, kind of like our squat training. The Chinese do a lot of weights at 80%. The greatest weight lift for the Soviet Union years ago, 780 cases. They're 50% of the training between 75 and 85%. So the mean is 80%. That's exactly why I do it. They had great researchers like A.S. Primlum. Um, Mr. Primlum was a national coach for the junior team from 75 to 1980 and then the, the senior coach from 80 to 85. He had some of the strongest people that ever lived. Victor Saltz, look him guy up, he looked like a caveman. Uh, they said he pushed her at 590, 595 at 220. And would you, you always use a straight bar or a different bar? Uh, well, that's, all right, good, we're getting into this. No, we use many, many bars. No, that's fine. Um, we use, uh, we have, you need a lot of bars, but to, to, uh, not to accommodate to uh, what you're doing. If you, 
you know, accommodation leads to no progress or actually going backwards. So we use a T-bar. You use a couple weeks of T-bar, however you like to do it. Then a football bar. You know, football bar's got three grips. So I, I like, again, even though you're instead like this or like this, I like to go three, three, three. And if you've got weak arms, you better start with the closest grips and go out. Because you might not finish up the workout, see? Mm -hmm. Especially if you keep the rest period. Most people don't train dense enough. You want to take short rest periods. There's no reason to, re to take long rest periods. It's, th it doesn't work. You need to get the majority of your work done in 45 minutes before serum testosterone drops. No, like you just said, we, re we have a lot of people, especially with that football bar inside grip, that halfway through or towards the end can't finish. So should I be having them just skip that and do the extra sets out or lighten the weight? No, 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 no. Don't skip what you're bad at. So take some weight off so they can do it. No, start them with to get the three grips out of the way. Oh, do all three grip. of those. Right get, off the, the get their weakest grip done with. Okay. Then you go out, you got less try, less try, less try, less try. All right. All right. So get the triceps out of the way first with the close grips. Okay. My, I had a friend, exceptionally strong, 500 adventure, 198, Gary Sanger, it raw, number 98 uh, in the world, 1984. Gary... <laughs> was very explosive and he always had to do the close grips first but he could not go out there if he because he'd wear out if he went the other way and when he was a monster of a guy i mean he had muscles like falling off him and where did the three reps come from i started three reps because of primitive chart he talks about three to six reps at 70 percent the reason he would stop at six because the bar would slow down but we're in that is for weightlifting and we're in a sport that takes longer a period of time you know to do than a, than a snatch or a clean and jerk he had to struggle so uh, we elongated the time somewhat by um, that reason. Okay. <clears throat> Another thing that a lot of people get confused on is they mix up the dynamic effort for the lower body and the upper body with the 50, 55, and 60%. But on the bench press, you don't do that. Can you explain why? Well, we normally don't do that, although a few people do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if you're the kind of guy that wants to do it, go ahead, 50, 50 because the bar does start to slow down a little bit too much. You know, so, but if you could do it, uh, Travis Bell was here. Travis, uh, roll, bench 575, weighing 260 to me, you know. And then uh, Travis would run the weights. Uh, he would do uh, 205, 225, 245 in three-week weights. But he was, he was a jacked-up dude, you know what I mean? Uh, a lot of people can't do this. It all looks simple. You know, I, I uh, again, Hammer said the dynamic method made him strong because he thought that Max ever. But you ever notice you get sore from speed day than you do max effort day? One reason, the volume is much higher. Mm -hmm. Multiply this volume, you got a tremendous amount of work, you know. I mean, um, well, if you did 100 reps and you did 250 pounds, it's 25,000 pounds of work. Max effort day is nowhere near like that. You know, you get up real quick, we'll get into that later. But uh, that's the difference. So that volume gets to even eight sets of dribble. You know, I mean, there's 25 lifts, with 250 pounds, add that up, that's a lot. That's what, 7,500 up in there, something like that. I don't know, <laughs> but it's a lot. All right, so I, I might not be the only one to get confused. So if I am, then I look stupid. Can we go backwards? Are you replacing speed day or max effort day with the repetition day, the six by six? Well, or you could choose, depending no, on who we're fast. These sets are done week after week. That's on speed day. Right. But you can go in and get a record for six and do that on max every day. Okay. But I don't recommend you doing that while you're doing the six by six, eight by eight, or ten by ten. Get back what you're doing singles. You floor press for a single, you incline for a single, uh, you decline for a single, you do a max six on the bench. Right. And whenever, I don't want to talk about max every day, but you know, every exercise should lead to improvement in all exercises. If you go to the floor press, you know, I haven't made progress, you got to sit down, don't look at the floor press, look at the exercises that preceded that and say, where am I messing up? Why did not I break my floor press record? Because all, right, all those exercises make the next exercise stronger. Yeah. That's the theory of our training, the conjugate system. That's partly part of it, you know. Okay. Um, back to the bars, though. <clears throat> Here at Westside, I mean, <clears throat> to me, a gym, uh, you know, it's, been a, it's not cheap, but to, you can get a pretty quick gym if you have a lot of bars. We've got more bars than I can count. But, uh, again, we speed date with a T-bar, football bar, a regular bench bar, you know, our bulldog bar, which is 55 pound, a bow bar, so it's an inch and a half camber, or we have th two camber bars, um, a three and five eighths or five or five inch camber. And that's a tremendous workout. Years ago, uh, uh, a guy, Mike McDonald, set many, many world records. And his friend, he liked to do push-ups. So he, his friend, he got where he couldn't do 
you know, weighted just he could do a main push and started putting weight on his back. Then he put him in between two chairs with weight on his back. And his friend got sick of doing all this, so his buddy built a bar, a Cambry bar. Well, because of Mike being a popular bencher in World Record, they call it the McDonald Bar. Nowadays, no one knows it. They don't know the history of our sport. Just like many people would call um, the safety squad bar a Hatfield bar. I, I, uh, I, you know, I wrote articles about the bar later on, but Fred used the Hatfield bar a lot. And they called it, uh, people then would call it a Hatfield bar. Well, Jesse Hoagland made it. The original bar was made by Jesse Hoagland. It was made for uh, soccer and rugby players. They didn't want to put bars in their back. A little bit of information about the history of the bars, you know. Oh, that's cool. Okay. But all these bars, <clears throat> out maybe with the exception of the five inch camera, you can use the same way. All right? Mm -hmm. You can use the same way. Uh, we even have a freak bar. It's a spring bar, internal and external. We do a lot of that. Okay, so that's that's pretty much the bars. Um are we got more questions just about the barbell training on speed day before yeah. I get into assistant? Do you do um, we do a lot of benching. Does anyone do any speed work for overhead pressing or seated pressing too? Absolutely. If you're an Olympic lifter, I mean that's what you're going to do. You're going to overhead press, and you can do you can do uh, behind the head, in the front. It doesn't matter. Incline. You can do speed work with incline, decline. Um, there's guys um, that did dumbbell work, heavy dumbbell floor press. They like to do heavy dumbbells uh, on, uh, for their speed work. You know, 100, 125 pound dumbbells are big guys, and. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, Clay Brandenburger brings one to mind. Clay was a big bencher, you know, 10 years ago. He did a lot of heavy floor press, you know, relax, boom, uh, heavy floor press of dumbbells, and re uh, really like that. So, any variety, speed is speed, you know. So, you said that you don't wave your bench stuff like you do the uh, lower body dynamic, so 50, 55, 60. If you're not strong <clears throat> enough or fast enough, do you just start with a slow, lower percentage or do you You just stay there. Wave? you got to realize, too, you could jump 10% of a squat. 10% of 800 is nothing. 10% right. of 300 might kill you. you got to look at it like that. You know, we, you know what I mean? We've had 83 guys squat 800. So they anybody can jump 5% a week for a couple of weeks. Um, but in the bottom, you know, you can try it. I mean, because like I said, uh, you know, Bell did it, um, uh, and uh, so if you're fast enough, do if it. you're fa if it moves, it, it, you can do it. Yeah. If you're not and, fast enough, and, you stay with the same weight. And back there, it. that's a that's a like an eight triple thing for the most part. You know, you start you go it's definitely going to slow down if you get fives or eights and all that. Yeah. So I wouldn't do it there. You're six by six, eight by eight, ten by tens. That'd be really good for someone who's weak at the start too to build up their strength. That's right. Though those, like I said, those are wide. Like Bill told me to do them wide. Uh, I got most of my bench training. I was never. Larry Pacific has told me when I could bench, when I learned how to be a top 10 bencher, I, I could win a Nationals. That was in 1970 when it all started. 1980, I, I made my first top 10 bench, eight, and I won a Nationals. Larry, he was dead on. And he always told me to train my, bench, my arms, and Bill Cino had me wide. So I did them both. When I did the wides, I did an enormous amount of extensions. When I did close work, then I could cut some of my extensions out. I didn't want to overtrain. Always train optimally. Don't be a puss, but train optimally. You know, more's not always better. Walking out of the gym dead, you know, no one cares because, you know, when you go to war, you go to kill, not to get killed. So don't kill yourself in the gym. I've seen many, many, many people do this. And they go to the gym, they wonder where their lifts are. And Tommy, you sit, and we won't bring up any names, but how many guys in the gym, like, they have lack of confidence, and so they'll take heavyweight, 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 and not even get to the meet. Too many. They do too many. You know, if you beat me up in a dark alley, uh, and um, and then two weeks later, he beats me on the dark alley. All I know was I got beat up in a dark alley. So a squat can destroy the other two lifts, or the, or you know, or the bench can destroy the other two lifts. And of course, the deadlift can really destroy it. So just, we'll get into periodization to get some sometimes later how we finish up, and I, we will talk about how we finish up the bench for contest here today. And just like the squat, do you uh, base your percentages off your straight bar bench, or off each individual um, bar's bench, like a football bar and a camber bar? Well, like, for, like well, for speed day, I think you probably do what I do. You just use the, the one record. Yeah. But like I said, the only bar I think I might but would change might be that five inch camera. If camera, if you can use a five inch camera, it's pretty hard. It's pretty tough. It's gonna be hard on the shoulders. Or? Hard on the shoulders. It's five inches deeper and it's yeah. five inches up farther. And the band, so you're doing a lot. You're doing ten inches more work on every set. So if you want to calculate it, that's a lot of extra work. You know. I'm thinking through with that camber bar, if you're if you're a pretty 
big guy or jack guy, it'll take some weight to touch that. Yeah. A lot of people can't touch that with 135, 225. Yeah, if you're not built to bench and you're strong, it's going to take a lot of weight to get down. I mean, it's... I do them, and I do them like the JM press. I don't even... I'll probably come about that far on my chest, but it really lives up my arms. That's why I do a lot of it. I'm basically retired, but it's almost like heavy dumbbells. You know, so I'd like to do, do that. <clears throat> Any questions on bars or so forth? How about what do we do after the speed day? Yeah. All right, immediately after speed benching, I got this from East German shot putters. I talked to a biomechanics expert, and Uta Beyer, uh, one of their famous shot putters, uh, touch and go bench uh, 727. I was a shot putter. He's not a power lifter. Um, and I got my bench program from East German shot putters. Uh, they would do six sets of triples, which is optimal weights, if you look at Primal's chart, but we're not shot putters, we bench, that's why we always did that. The full 24 lifts or in Indian Daxi more. Um, but uh, so you want to uh, concentrate on, I, I like two sets of dumbbells. They did, they did four sets of dumbbells every other day. Now a lot of people can't do this, but I like to do, if I get the guys to do it, at least two sets of dumbbells before you go in your triceps. Um, <clears throat> you're pretty strong, you probably use 100 pound dumbbells for 20 reps. Okay, it, yeah. so what I would have you do is 75 for two sets of 20. I'm an, I'm an optimal weight. It warms up the entire upper body, then you move into your triceps. All right? Like after you finish speed bench. As soon as you speed bench, grab up two sets of 75s. You don't, if you've got to warm up to them, then it's too heavy. Just grab them up and do them. All right? Two sets. And I recommend them every other day. I, I mean, I, I don't understand why people don't think you can train your upper body <clears throat> on a squat or the other day. But whoever made that rule? Or who says you can't do some reverse hypers on bench day? I, I don't get it. And you need to train your abs every day. But just go and do these two sets, and it's going to warm up your body. Europe never had a 700-pound bencher. And my buddy, uh, Sakari, would come over all the time. And I told Sakari to go back and do this. And then he got 900-pound benchers. And he said, this is the reason. The work, they, you ever look at a lot of Europeans, they're not built like us. You know, they can pull. They're more athletically built. They are good pullers, but their benches aren't that good. And, and so he went back and actually did some hypertrophy work, and what happened? Their benches went up a couple more times. So, yeah, oh, and also, what they did, and I, I recommend the very same thing, <clears throat> you know, you do your two sets of, uh, um, you know, dumbbells flat. The next time you do them, incline. Now, you may have to adjust the weight, you know, and then next time, decline, next time, seated. So you might have to adjust the weight on the incline or, or seated, but the... But every time you come in, change positions, change positions. Too many people do the same thing over and over and over, and that's why they stale. They get stale and they stop. You know, a lot of women have a new dress, they don't want to go out to eat. They have to stay at home. <laughs> so always put a lot of variety in your training. You know, the more extroverted you are, the more you have to switch. I've had introverts here that need very little stimulus, but most of my guys are extroverted. They need a lot of stimulus. Chuck Vogelpohl needed lots and lots of stimulus. Most of my, because it's the system they're brought up in, the conscious system calls for that, uh, but they understand, you know, like, I thought like this, years ago, uh, someone said, how do you get your bench up? Well, Lou, you got a close grip bench, how do you get your regular bench up? So, okay, so it worked. I said, but well, how could, then how can I get my close grip bench up? Extensions. You know, if the close grip made my regular bench, well, if I made my close grip go up, it made my regular bench go up even more. So I've always broken things down one bit farther than what most people did. Um, that's where it comes to extension. But if you do your two sets, you go to extensions. And, um, um, you know, you can do uh, rollbacks, rollback extensions. Don't be dropping your arms down. Take, bend them and roll back. Don't, if you roll that thing, go like this. It's, you're longer with your shoulders. You want to bend them at the elbow, roll them back and hit them. Roll them back and hit them. All right? Don't do them, like a, don't do them too strict like a bodybuilder like kickbacks because it's, it's pretty rough on the elbows if heavy weight. But just make sure you roll them back. So you do those. And I always like to do a barbell, straight bar, easy curl, um, camber bar. I love camber bar extensions. I'll put my thumb up inside it, roll down, roll right in my face. All right, I get a lot deeper extension by rolling that, that bar's on me in the face. I roll down on my face and really blow up this muscle right here, which contributes to most of the bench. Um, so so the, the advantage of the rolling it instead of straight up and down is better on the elbows? Yeah, but if you see, look, look at his arm, if you if see us on camera, if he lowers a dumbbell like this, and then roll, what, how did he get the dumbbell down? His shoulder. Then roll back, um, and then, but then you'll do it properly on the concentric, but on the eccentric, you're not using any tricep, you're using your shoulder. See the shoulder? 
I want him to bend here. Put all the pressure there, roll back, put the pressure here and here, then roll it up back out of there. Okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. And uh, in the, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't want to screw this up. But no, uh, you asked so, a question. Yeah, Tom and I were talking about this like right when I got here because we really need to get our bench up at our gym. I'm sure we're not alone. Uh, talking about how to identify what somebody needs to train after the bench. So it was speed day if we're doing dumbbells, but then what about after that, like upper back versus tricep extension? Well, how do we identify what each I'm person I'm getting needs? that before I was interrupted. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good question though, because that's what everybody, um, it is, uh, to me, I go way back what Larry said, it's the arms, you gotta train your arms. So that's why we go straight into these extensions, roll backs, elbows out. Uh, these things, a lot of people call them tape presses, well, a guy in my gym, I smacked in the head, 300 pound guy, and we got into it, <clears throat> and he arm barred my arm out of socket. So for two months later, I take a bar and it'd fall down. Don Dammer, a great friend of mine, and take a bar, I couldn't hold even a bar up. So I started doing uh, elbows out extensions. These extensions are really called Jim Williams extensions. You know, from uh, he was from New Jersey, and he'd been 675 in 1972. And the second highest bench at that time was Pat Casey, 617. There's only six men that ever done it. All right, and so he did. It, 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 you see a lot of bodybuilders do one one at a time. Oh, so I've seen it. Williams press on your. That's your right. That's thing. what that is. Okay. I mean, I love Dave Tate, but he wrote about it. Of course, they call him a tape press. And I write about demo deadlifts. I, I did him, but demo you know made him famous because he jumped up and broke world record in the squat, and he's my friend. <laughs> All right. So uh, I, I like what I like to do is two extension, one workout, a straight bar extension, easy curl bar, the camber bar, then. Of some variety, rollbacks um, or elbows out or French press. When it, you know, you got healthy shoulders, I think French press is tremendous. You know, the seated, rolling back behind your head. I think those are tremendous. You see a lot of bodybuilders do tons and tons and tons of those. Things. Sitting up straight. Sitting up straight. Mm -hmm. And now I'm sure a lot of people are also wondering, like, if raw and gear, this all applies to everybody. Yeah, the problem is now you got too many gear fags and they can't. They're raw. They're they're pathetically weak. <laughs> I've been 315 for 23 reps and I sucked in my gym. I absolutely sucked. You know, when I tell people that their bench sucks, uh, my bench sucked with the guys I was training with. I've had six, more than six guys roll bench over 600. We officially have two 650s and a 630 roll bench, and we don't even do roll any contest. And a 550 at 98. What, Nick Winters? Nick Winters. Nick Winters. Uh, he got a credit for 650, he did 700, but he never got credit. He doubled six. He doubled seven hundred at the Arnold Classic in an exhibition form. What about tell me what, what JM did for JM presses? The JM press is one of my. That's one of my favorites. Uh, my bench. I relied on two things later in my career, and I, it's no big deal because, like I said, I'm an average bencher, but I was smarter because I wrote an article in '93 about uh, three guys had three guys could bench six hundred. The only gym in the world could do it at the time, and they were all juniors. And uh, J.M. Blakely then came in he, and uh, he did the J.M. press. And so you do the J.M. press, you take a bar, close grip, take it, take it down. It's got, you can't do this, it's, it's shoulder. Take it down across your face. It's gonna, you're, if you're big, which I have no arms, it's easy for me to do. Uh, but your forearm's gonna build up, smash into your uh, upper arm. It's gonna, then you roll back, you put tension right here. P Pablo will call it power stretching. Then straight up, roll back down, straight up. Well, I watched J.M. do um, five, I handed him 545 for a triple. And I'm going like, you know, but I added mine up. I could do 365. I had a 565 bench. Uh, this is back before this kind of crazy beer. It was in a shirt, but you got about, you know, lucky to get 100 pounds out of the shirt. And I, so I did 365 had a, uh, in a 565 bench. Well, I, but that made J.M. 10% stronger than J.M. Prince than I was. Now, I don't care how good a guy is. It's called a web. I should be proportionally as good as he is, but my bench is he is with his, right? Like if you can do half your deadlift in a good morning, well, so should I. So I pushed that up to 405 for three, and I bent 600. And I was 50 years old, and no one had ever benched 550 at that time. What weight class are you? Uh, I weighed 240, weighed 244 pounds, drove two hours away, didn't make weight. You know. But I mean, you know, and I, I'm an average bencher, but I'm smart. And what I want to get to with the three boys, they end up breaking on, and Rob Fuser broke world records bench. But what I had them do, because and I wasn't going to lift them, but I was pulled out of retirement. And so I did what I told them to do, and oh, damn, it actually worked, even worked for me. 
because <laughs> I always set their training up, you know. And uh, but it's big, the JM press is big, down in the roll right here. And I always use carpet. I would put a piece of carpet in, set the take the bar down, roll, sit in the carpet, roll back to take a little bit. You're talking 405, and you know I don't have a biceps, so you put a lot of tension on your triceps. You know, the, if you roll that freaking thing back, see, you got to take it down, roll back, overload these arms, and then straight up, we call it fist first. Take it down, fist first. If you get down and go like that, it won't work. See, if I shrug it out of my shoulders, but it's just, it's fist first. Fist first. Yeah. Okay? And so, with all those different tricep extensions and presses, the Williams press and the JM press, how do you, you rotate those through? You rotate when you want them. Don't write nothing on paper. Never do that. Just uh, after two, th you, you, this system is based off training as hard as humanly possible. So in maybe three workouts or four, you have to switch or you want to do more progress. You know, if you come in and say, Lou, man, these, I, don't, I don't feel uh, these uh, dumbbell extensions are just not working. Well, why are we doing them in? Quit, go to something else. You know, so just move to another one, get new stimulus. Our idea about the system by switching is like going up a ladder. This, this, that rung that high, and that rung that high, and that rung that high, and all you do is keep growing up the ladder. Because all these exercises make the same muscle group stronger. But if you do the same one over and over, you literally will be detrained, you'll go backwards. And what would you do for volume on each of them? I like between 60 and 100 total reps. So, for me, what made me the absolute strongest was, uh, was uh, the JM press, you know, besides the small extensions, the dumbbells. And I covered on a tape, shows me doing 70s, I did 70s under for uh, eight sets of eight every 20 seconds. Set them down on your legs. That's why you got to train. You can't take all freaking day to train. It's, it's crap. It don't work that way. So, but it's on my, one of my bench press tapes years ago, and, and Howard was calling my time. But another exercise that was my favorite for the bench was close grip, super steep inclines. I hands on the smooth that take about 275 to touch, and I, you know, I, I was I was like averaging around 240 body weight. They take about 275 to touch. Uh, the other guys, they take a lot more, maybe 365. But down in there, because it overloads the arms so much at this close grip, you know. And then, and I, and I actually was uh, stood up. We, we placed the bench against the wall in a rack, and I stood up about an angle like that. It's not a, it's not a stand-up press, but it was close to it. And actually, I did 370 at that time. I had 370 uh, steep incline and a four or five for triple, and uh, in a power rack. With the, I, would, I did a lot of heavy extensions. I mean, this is a workout, <coughs> extensions. That's how important I thought it was. So I put a, a bar to pinch at my chest, right? All right, like a, so it's touching my chest. Then I would take the pins and lower them two inches. And I'd take a, a, a camber bar and take it down in there like that. And I'd done one with four or five well, paws off the pins like that. And that's when I could, that's when I, I mean, I could roll bench over 50 inches inside the ring. I could roll bench 500 any day of the week. And I was, you know, that was it. I mean, I was never meant to be a real big person. Because I, I did 515 at 202. I doubled 505 at, uh, at around 200 pounds at excavation and took it out myself. In a blast shirt, anyone will know what those are, I took out um, 496 and then meat and pinched it. I didn't hand, take a hand off, took it out myself. Well, what if somebody's, like, when they, they're getting, they get 300, they get 330. 340, it doesn't move like an inch. What do they need to build up? Well, that's you get stuck in the bottom of your upper back and triceps, but uh, upper back is what gets a barbell off your chest, strong lats. You know, what are lats? If I grab your arm and I fight you, your lats is fighting me. It's your lats that's, you know, determining where I'm pulling your arm or not pulling your arm. So you can have very upper strong back. Uh, we do enormous amount of shrugs. Tom here uh, has always been inverted, inverted somewhat, you know, and I noticed his posture has changed a lot and it helped the squat a lot. But what helped everything, yeah. right? And we do a lot of shrugs. Believe it or not, we do wheelbarrow shrugs. Years ago, there was a, a guy that held the world record for whatever it meant. He sat on a chair and shrugged underneath him and pulled up against that chair and he did like crazy 650 pounds and stuff like that. And we do lots of wheelbarrow shrugs. And I think shrugs is uh, important because it keeps your shoulders healthy. And it seems like the more we shrug, the more our benches go up. Hmm. Yeah, we, yep. we do that sometimes too, because like, you could get inside of it with a bar, you can't really shrug. Mm -hmm. Try that wheelbarrow, we, yeah. we, because we deal with fighters, so we roll the wheelbarrow out in front, and you got to pull it back. Roll it out in front, pull it back. And in reverse too. In reverse, you turn around and do it. And if you want to build your the bottom of your traps in the mid-back, 
you roll the barbell, you roll the wheelbarrow to you, drop your chin, and just really roll the elbows back. Do that right now, and you'll feel it. You're Jack. You'll feel that. Feel that? Yeah. Drop that chin. <laughs> feel that? Yeah. It'll build the hell out of your middle, low, middle, middle back where it traps. You see them bodybuilders? See that big diamond? No, you don't see that very often. But that's how you can build it. Yeah, that's right. Lou, the uh, thing on the triceps. Um, a lot of people get confused that the lateral head is important. But can you explain what part of the tricep is? crucially important. Yeah, the lateral heads are also called the lazy head. They don't do anything. You know, bodybuilders got arms that big, but they, a lot of them can't bend. Some of them can, but most can't. It's the it's the long heads that tie into the elbow. It's the extensions. Whenever we work with fighters, we have to do lots of extensions like we do because it, it normally only thing it affects is around the elbow, so you get a good snap on the end of your punch. Same thing for this. Um, you look at the Chinese, they do a lot of stuff like that. For weightlifting, they say they do two bodybuilding workouts at the end, two bodybuilding exercises at the end of all the workouts, and, and for, for the arm extensions, for the jerk. Mm -hmm. So that's why they do it. You know, also, uh, I'll bring up something. Uh, um, uh, A.J. Roberts come here. And it took a little bit to figure out what he was doing. He had a 10 away squat. Then we got 10-10 in the pounds meeting it. But in his squat, we figured his squat out. He went right up to 12.05. And the bench... He come here for about a 7-11 bench. He gets a, a 7.25 and he, oh, my elbows hurt. My, I said, I'll tell you why they hurt, AJ, because they're weak. He goes, what? So we'd argue about it, you know, like everybody else. But then, so I got him to start doing thousands of extensions. He would, no, no less than 300 push downs a week, lightweight, to build up the ligaments and tendons like we're talking about your shoulder problem. And all of a sudden, now James, or, uh, AJ's bench started to go. It went from that seven and a quarter in about two years to, to 9.15. And then he quit. There's no doubt in my mind he would have been a thousand had he kept going. <clears throat> and uh, but you have to do ultra high reps. We don't have any elbow, knee, low back, no tendonitis, nothing like that because we do all these ultra high reps for the ligaments and tendons. You, as everyone knows, muscles grow at a faster rate than ligaments and tendons. Did not anyone ever think, well, why don't you trade the ligaments and tendons? You know, in Chinese years ago, uh, the the kung fu masters had. Uh, ligament tendon uh, changing uh, training and they did the same type of crazy stuff you know if you ever watch a kung fu movie which is some of my favorite um you'll see a lot of weird stuff but you know what you go home and go damn i have plyometrics you know jumping out of holes of water in there doing all this stupid stuff that you see a uh, pj Penn do today you know and i'm going like you know you can learn something from everything anyone who reads a book and don't learn as a, as a moron I'm a moron and I can learn something, so surely if you think you're smart, you better be able to learn something. And only a fool can't learn. So always learn something from whatever I watch. I watch, uh, uh, Carlos Corvella told me one time, he's a second degree black belt in Jiu Jitsu. And he goes, You know, if I want to work on my uh, technique of arm bar, choke, knee bar, he says, I don't work with good guys because it's just it's a stalemate. I pick a bad guy as I, uh, like Tommy, I'm going to go out to your elbow. I'm going after your right arm. That's all I'm going to do. Tommy will defend it like hell, and you got to really work to get that. You know, because they'll transition elbow into a chokehold, and you know what they're doing. Or I'm going after your neck, Tom. And so he told me that's how it works. Well, what I'm trying to say is I actually learned a lot of t technique by watching bad lifters. I'm going like, you know, because I took it for, I, I come up in a private gym. There was seven of us, uh, something like that, in my garage in 1980. We were national team title record holders or title uh, champs. And so everyone I grew up had impeccable form, you know, did everything right. But then you get around people who don't not like, you know, like your girl this morning. What did we do? We took her feet out. What happened? Her chest came up. Her knees went out. Got I mean, did you take it out? When you go back home, take it out a little bit more and watch what happens. And you don't ever tie your record, dude. That's <laughs> yeah, like, I know. That's like making out for your sister, which I've done, <laughs> but you just don't want to do it. <laughs> what can... Um... We talk about the variations that you do on max effort days, like... Uh, yeah, we got this see... covered. Oh, all right, sorry. Yeah, okay. Only right. thing I can tell you, like, a lot of upper back, we do a lot of upper back, side, and rear right. delt. Okay. Uh, you can do front delt raises, of course you should, like Williams did a lot of that. They called them William raises. And, um, but, but but don't overtrain your front delt. If, I mean, if you're if you're a mirror queer, and you look at and you do curls, your front delts are popping out. So it's easy to overtrain your front delt. All right, so just be careful. So, but you do need to train it. But those wide grips and the inclines and all, you, you know, I see, I, I yell at my guys all the time, right, Tom? 
do decline, do incline, it gets stuck to one angle. When you bench, you are going, like it or not, we are taught to press straight, like shot putters. No rotation. If I press that bar straight, well, my, if my elbow's turning, no. When your elbows are rotated, you have rotator problems. That's how you get them tore out. So if you can press the straight line, Joe McCoy was one of the best I've ever seen. He, Joe raw benched uh, 515 of 184. All right, and he had a 455, and I told him he had to get it up because I told him I did messing with him. He's 19 years old. And he, in about four months, he went from 455 to 515. And Joe would just press dead straight up. I watched him in meets, actually press the bar so straight, it sometimes fall back on the belt, just boom. I've seen but that, do that in a video. Yeah, well, that's how Jim Williams benched. And a guy go, uh, Bill Thumper, from the original Westside Barbell in California, he said bench four, towards your feet, and then at the very end, and let it float back, you know, at the top. But it's, if you go this way, you're screwed. And see, um, what you're talking about, if, if a guy does press the bar, a lot of people say, push it over your face. Huh, you're taking a chance to turn a rotator. But that tells me, if you're successful at it, that your shoulders are stronger than your arms. Because you're going the bar to migrate back into your shoulders. If you had strong arms, it's naturally going to go in a straight line. So that's how I can tell. If you press bars back over your face, I tell you, work your arms. If you press bars straight out, I tell you, work your shoulders. Because your arms are down if it goes straight, so let's build your shoulders up some more, right? If it starts to fade back, then we get back on arms. You know? You need a you need a big base, too. The upper back needs to be huge. Right. You can't have too big. Guys used to come by gym years ago, uh, like in all these 600 roll benches, and they go, man, there's everybody in your gym's got huge upper backs. I mean, a lot of them are big deadlifters, too, but I mean, I had a big upper back, and everybody in my gym had bigger backs, and we just lived on it. We do a lot of sled work outside, pulling an upright row, you know, out to the <coughs> side, external rotation. So, tons and tons and tons of, you can't do too much. You cannot, if you can systematically figure out how, you cannot train too much. If a guy tells me he can train too much, I want to ask that man if he has a 500 bench. I want to ask him how he went from 200 to 3. He had to do more work. How'd he go from three to four? He certainly had to do more work. And to get to four to five, he had to do a lot more work. So how, So if you learn to do it systematically, you know, the Gracie said it in jiu-jitsu, you gotta learn to, to smite, fight smarter, not harder. And that's what I learned over the years. I finally got it in my head, you know. I gotta get smarter than these weights because weights don't get old. <laughs> and the weights, yes, they do hit back. Well, you said that don't train by field, train by math. You could go go by percentages and go by math, because math doesn't lie. If you, if you train by feel all the time, you're gonna disillude yourself. I watch a lot of guys, uh, they think intensity is a feeling. It's a mathematical formula, remember that. And and there's two kind of maxes, you know, there's a training max and a context ma contest. I was I like to talk, run my mouth all the time. You thought I could cross, cross dribble and everything, you know. And, but I love the, I was always excited when I lifted, but I did get my adrenaline flow. It's the worst thing you can do. You save that for a contest. Just I'll be running my mouth towards you, and you know, and the uh, reason why, because you're going to say something back to me, hopefully. You say something back to me, you didn't take my mind off that work, my, my weight. I'm not scared of that weight. I don't worry about that weight now. What the fuck do you say? You know? And so now my mind's on everything but the chance of that bar killing me. And, you know, Dave Tate was always trying to kill me. I hope he dies. I hope he gets hurt, you know. This is every day, every day, every day. So we were always into it and made training the funniest thing in the world. You know what I mean? I mean, it was so intense, but made it fun. Yeah. So get your mind off. The, you know, You know, like, and here's something else. A lot of people that think, how do we, you know, they say, look, how do you plan the training for your guys? Well, I don't. I bring a guy in here. He better be smart enough in a few months to figure it out or he's gone. There's no help for him. But that we decide at breakfast. The guy, I said, Joe, like Joe, what do you do? What are we doing? Ah, oh, I think we'll floor press today. Or Wesley. I think we'll incline, whatever. They do it then. Like, think about this. Like, uh, or I'll put myself in this spot. Uh, I suck at the floor press. And we're very competitive. So, you go, hey, Lou, we're going to floor press next Wednesday. And I'm kicking your ass. and going, oh, my God. I suck at the floor press. I don't like this guy anyhow. <laughs> and he's going to kick my ass. And now I'm working about for seven days. Right? But think, but so we go and do it at the last minute. There's no anxiety. Take anxiety out of training. You know, so I might. So you're going to kick my ass, but for 20 minutes it beats the crap out of seven days in 20 minutes, right? Because <laughs> people will dwell on that night and day. I've seen it, and they'll fall apart. So you can't, you know.
Because you're going to have that feeling going to me or a game. Oh, you better. Whatever. Like, like uh, Todd Brock, I saw Todd Brock after a few years in, in um, Cincinnati a couple of weeks ago, and Todd trained here. He goes, going to a meet was a joke compared to the training. Because the training, it was freaking $200 on a box while you're box squatting. I mean, that was, that was nothing. Just cash dollars and uh, debit platform, money laying down there. 100, 200, 300 dollars. You got teams. You guys want to get somewhere? Uh, floor press or incline. Break your team. Break your gym up into teams. You and me against those two. You will not believe the record you'll get to. Uh, so you, so we don't lose. You'll get a twenty pound record so we don't lose. And not about the money. With well, the money was just the fun part. But all my guys are gamblers and thugs and everything. And he went to thug you. That's where everybody went back then. <laughs> yeah. Who's in there smart, Joe? And um, he said that uh, they'd be deadlifting. Next thing, someone hold on to a bar. Before 40, they'd hold on to see who would on the lot. And next thing, $20, $20, $20. Before you knew, there's 250 bucks. And they'd be holding on to a bar for as long as they could. They couldn't even, their hands would get stuck to the bar and they couldn't <laughs> use their fingers. <laughs> I'd be bad and Chuck holding a, uh, 85 pound dumbbells. They just couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the same kind of see what's up. But that's what makes it fun. You got to make training fun, you know? But uh, I ran on anger. I, I hated every one of my gym. When I come in, you put my briefs on, it's like you wrapping my hands for a fight, literally. And uh, I, I mean, I got in a fight with the same guy three times in my gym. And, you know, and we're friends, but that's just the way it was. You wrap me up and you say something to me, you, done, you know, I just couldn't function that way. Because I was getting ready to do something. My work was all serious. I was older than everybody. I was smarter than everybody. So, you know what I mean? It's hard for me to keep my head above water as it was. Yeah. Um, where are we at? <clears throat> max effort. You think we're good then? <clears throat> okay, max effort. When do you do max effort? Well, the, the, uh, many, many books, like the Practice Science of Strength Training, says you can do extreme workouts for 72 hours. So we do. It gives you adequate rest to do this maximum. But in the middle now, you do small workouts. Every 12 or 24 hours, you do a small workout. So don't worry about doing some extensions tonight and bench tomorrow morning. If it affects you, you're out of shape, dude. You know, years ago in the very beginning, I would take the trash out a month before a meet. And then at the end, I'm dragging sleds on Wednesday before I drove out of town for a meet on, you know, for Friday. I leave on Thursday, go to York, you know, six hours away. So, but I got it, I finally got through my head, get in freaking shape. And the older you get, the more you got to do. Uh, I mean, I, I, I was, I was four best in the world in total at 50 years. I was, ten, I was still top 10 at 57 in deadly. And I didn't do it by doing less. I did it by doing a hell of a lot more. You know, and having good training partners. I, we talked about training partner before, but if you got a bad guy, you kick him out. If it's your mother, kick her out. <laughs> it don't matter because she's a training partner. Yeah. And everybody says, you know, they said, who'd you ever bring gym, in the gym, Louie? I said, I never brought nobody. I didn't have anybody could lift any weights. I've never brought a person in the gym. And Tom can tell you that we're constantly trying to get good lifters to come here. I mean, good ones. I expect world records. I expect chalk, and that gym's a serious chalkboard, you know. <laughs> It's a serious, the 98s, um, thousand pound squat, a 900 bench, a 755 deadlift, and a 2405 total. That's what I expect. You know, if you uh, don't bother to show up in any of my weight class, you don't think you can get on my chalkboard because I don't need you. You know, all, everybody says, Lou, I think you can help me a lot. But what can you do for one side? I think Kennedy said something like that <laughs> yeah. after I did. <laughs> you also said that Louis Simmons never entered the gym. That's that, a big thing. That's what I'm telling you about. Mm -hmm. uh, Louis never walked in the door. Never. And I got hauled out her a few times. But, I mean, when I walk in that door, I became someone else. I won't tell you who. I'll never tell you. But I became another person. And, I mean, it, and it was on. I mean, like I said, you got to train. It's, training is like, it has to be like a fight. And uh, I know the militants and a lot of camps around America that 95% of the sparring is a fight. And that's how I looked at training. I mean, like I, I hate someone. What, what I really hated, if, I, if I'm kicking your ass, but you should be kicking mine, I hate your ass because you're, you're a puss. Mm -hmm. and, but if you're beating me and I'm thinking this man should not be beating me, I'm hating me. I hated me just as much as I hate you. So I was in the gym. I, I didn't give a damn. And I'd always say, well, if you smack me in the face, let me know what I said when I get out of the gym. Dave Tate would just flip out, you know, called him Zippy. He'd have Zippy. He'd just turn into Zippy. Just go crazy. Threaten him almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> and that was his always. And everybody, was, it was constant. I always said, you got to irritate or motivate. If you don't irritate me or motivate me in the gym, I don't need you. Why do I need you? 
I can stare at a damn mirror like I did for six years and, you know, get mad at my own dumb self, you know. Yeah, I can't right. watch the news. I get so mad I want to tear my TV down now and I'm 68. Do you think the, the smaller gym is better for that, that atmosphere, having a smaller gym? Yeah, you, that's very good, Tom. Uh, years ago, our gym was 800 feet and uh, yeah, I had vocal pull there and Jimmy Ritchie. I mean, these guys are all whacked out and and uh, Matt Demo, and you know, it goes on and on and on. And you know, you almost be beside, it's irritating because someone's right, I don't want anybody beside me, and you're always beside someone. You actually had to move something to do something else. And so, and the windows are blacked out, and we're in the ghetto. You know, and the ghetto people never even, they didn't even stop in. They'd stop in and give me 40s, and then they'd leave. <laughs> Here's a 40, Lou. Hey, thanks, man. I'll think, go. They, they were no part of us. They never tried to rob us, because, but you know what I'm saying? That's the way the gym was back in. But it was very fierce and very competitive. And I mean, in breakfast, you would, um, Mike Ruggiero is a good friend. He's a good friend of mine. We're having breakfast. I'm talking about guys showing up for late. I know we're having breakfast at 6 in the morning. And they say, ah, Mike, he always shows up. I said, yeah, he does. I get mad. I'm eating breakfast. I'm mad. I said, God damn, why does he always show up late? So we start at 7.30. We get there. Would you believe he's not there? He shows up at 8 o'clock. Or, or, you know, he shows up about 10 minutes late. And I go, hey, Mike. Why can't you show, it's a 360 pound man, nothing but muscle. I go, why can't you show up on time? It's supposed to be here at 7.30. He said, well, Lou, it's 7.30 by the clock of my Jeep. I said, we don't train in your Jeep. <laughs> and Mac left for six months and then he came back. But that's how it was, you know. You can't let nobody off the hook. I said stuff to Chuck Vogelpool and then keep my eye on because I think he's going to be punched me in the face. <laughs> but I never not said something. I mean, you can just see, he's just beat red. And Jimmy Ritchie, these guys, I mean, you know, these are not what you call sociable people, but you <laughs> never stop me from saying what I want and, you know, and pay the consequences. You have to. We were just talking about Are, kicking people out and punishments he's done for people being late because it'll just be chaos if you don't have it. We gave a little shout out to Mark Marinelli, but Mark trained here and Mark would rather fight than lift and he was a good lifter, but then he moved to Cleveland, started a strong style and congratulations for Stipe Milinovic just won a UFC heavyweight title. That's Miochik. the kind of guys, huh? Miochik. Miochik, yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, but I mean, I, we're so proud of Mark and him, you know. It's it's yeah, uh, that was awesome. Yeah, it's good to have the baddest man in the world in Cleveland and the second baddest man. I don't know which one's which, Mark or or Stipe, but they'll have to fight it out. Well, big thing too. You guys would beat the shit out of each other in the gym, but outside the gym, that was it. It was all got left. Oh yeah, in the gym, and that was it. It was done. Then oh, outside, outside was a different story. Yeah, you know, to this day we have breakfast there, uh, four times a week. I believe you got to have it's a family. I mean, we went. I'm gonna tell you all the bad things we did, but we did a lot of good things together too. You know, but it was like a you got to have a thing. It's got to be a family. Like when I go out and lift, I'm thinking I don't want to fail in front of Chuck or or Dave Tate or or any. I don't want to fail. I can't freaking fail. How could I fail? And then you know, I got them guys behind me saying to do it. Uh, you, you're you're you know, you're motivated to do it. I use I use energy. If we're gonna get in a fight, I'm using your energy. I'm using Tom's energy. Cause I'm thinking Tom. I'm thinking he's behind. Me, might not be, but I've got every, everybody. My mom fucking behind me. I'm kicking your ass. Yeah. And I run on energy. And I, you know, it, like what Hulk Hulk Hogan, what do you say? If you slow down, you go down. So don't ever do that. And just you know, I always got one dream in my life. I'm going to succeed. You know, no matter how many times I fail. I've got that little dream I'm going to succeed today. And so that's what kept me going for years and years. Uh, back to Max Everett. All right. The main thing is each week you switch exercise. Switch, uh, uh, it could floor press, incline, decline, uh, one board, two board, three board. Switch something. We do a lot of band pressing. Mini bands for us is 85, monsters 125, lights is 200. That's one of my favorites uh, to, to bench against that. Also, uh, chains. One chain up to five. Um, it's 200 pound of chain. And when I did, I, I made 295 and 200 pound of chain and bench, I could bench 500 wrong. You know, I always use these indicators. Um, why do you want all these other exercises? Because if, if, in, a, in a meet, you got one record to break the bench press. But if you had 40 records to break and you constantly break them, and we break them at over a 90% rate, we go to meet. Why wouldn't you break your bench record? But remember, if you go, if, are you, are you, are you, uh, 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 lack self-confidence why are you testing yourself in the gym and failing a guy would tell me me many times by here Lou I, I, I stick right here what's the problem well probably you're benching too often how do you know exactly where your sticking point is you know, there's two ways to fix it um, speed is one of them being faster because strength's measured in time you only go so long to strain I've got so long and you got so long 
you don't complete the lift in that time period, you're not going to make it. So the speed has got a lot to do with it. Because weights, yes, they grow heavier, but they grow slower because of gravity. As, as weights grow heavier, they become slower. I look at it as slow and fast, not heavier light. All right? So, but I mean, you can have board records. Um, just look at this. You want to count these up. You got a record on one board, two board, three board, four board. That's four records. Wide grip. Um, all right, now medium grip, eight records. Close grip, 12 records. All right, you're doing board press. Two set of chain, three set of chain, four, just keep going and going and going. It's, uh, I mean, you literally can get up in the hundreds of exercises, you know, that you could break records on. The key is, uh, George Halbert said it best, there's builders and there's testers, like I just mentioned. Find out what the builders are, and then like a reverse band press, to me, they're nothing but a tester. If you break your reverse band press, you're stronger, but it don't make you strong. So test it there. Floor press is a, one of our major indicators how strong we are, all right, if you don't cheat, you know. So, but, so like again, you can have like one chain up to five, three different bands, chains and bands, different grips, Different boards, different pen presses, and many, many bars. Uh, what would be cheating on a floor press? Using your legs? Is that what you're saying? Not to getting your elbows on the ground, not oh, relaxing. Awesome. And your ass coming up in the air. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I watch guys get their ass up two feet. I said, if you're going to do that, why don't you just put something on your ass? So instead of raising it eight inches and 10 and 12, just leave it standard so you know if you're any stronger. And they never built their lockout. Never built anything. Um, let's see. Now, a lot of guys on board press, they think that I, I started board press. Jesse Count told me to start doing I did them in 19, in the 60s at Westside Barbell. I did board press and, and uh, rubber uh, pad press. So I did it too. And then I didn't do it for a long time. And Jesse Count, about 19, I said, Lou, you ought to get your guys to do board press. I don't know I used to. So I went up to doing it. And it was intended mostly for raw benching. And so we, but then everybody got done shirts. But I found that people could do more on three boards than four and more on two than three. And the reason is because the higher the board, the more tricep. And they'd use momentum out of the bottom to make the lift. Like I said, more speed. So we found out, like George Howard decided, that's why he went to four and five board. Because that's, you know, you, you lock out or not lock out. So he started doing a lot of high board press and built his triceps up. And I mean, George is an immensely strong person. But, you know, one of the most explosive strong benches I've ever had in my gym. Six and a quarter, touch and go, 232 or something like that, not bad. So you're saying the board presses was originally for raw, so that works. Well, there was no board, there was no shirts. So that, that yeah, Westside Barber was done in the '60s. Yeah, and then uh, and uh, but like I said, oh, and, but my point is, when you do a board press, you see guys heave. See, to me, board press are more of a tester than a builder because I cheat, like a lot of big fat guys. You know? take it down and heave it out of there. Uh, if you start, if if you think board press is building your triceps, you got to pause it and start with your arms. If you start with your pecs and delts. The best first ones to work is the primary muscle. That's why a lot of guys do port press and don't get any kind of lock hops out of it. You know, so you got to, whatever the, the first muscle to fire, that's the one that's doing, is going to build. So make sure if you need arms, you, you do arms. Don't set it down here, set it up in here like a JM press. Press up there. We do a lot with a he lot of heavy bands. Um, again, just like the lower body, a lot of people ask the question on. Well, I do one rep max, I do a three rep max, I do a five rep max. Uh, what should they do? Um, Funny, all the years, I went to contests when I was 14, and I competed when I was 63. And all those contests, they asked me to do one rep. <laughs> and that is called max effort. It's not plural, it's singular. You have to do one. If, if you do uh, two, three, four, five reps, they actually build strength endurance. And the idea of getting stronger is, is producing the max amount of force you can develop in one lift. So if a guy can bench 500 and he comes to tell me, I just tripled 490, that tells me he can bench 490. You know, it's better. But if he did 501, 505 for single, he could do 505. That's the only way I know that he can do that. So and the more endurance you got, the greater you are at reps, but the worse you are at single. Yeah, these college football, they come home from school to train and they have these charts that say if I bench 300 for four, I can do. And it doesn't mean shit, it never equates to it that. It never means anything. And also, you know, a lot of their squatting is the same way, you know, yeah. they haven't got a clue. But they're football players, so I excuse them. <laughs> you know, if they had a weight, a weight trained coach, 
for strength, it would be different than a football strength coach. Yeah. You know, I've often wondered how come I'm not an NFL football coach. Why do I have to play football? Because there's many strength coaches that never competed in meets, but yet they're strength coaches. Do you like the board presses for athletes as far as like maybe saving shoulders or anything? Well, I like it for football. applicable to football with the... A lot of football yeah. uh, board press and also uh, you want a one arm already dumbbells for football. Because yeah. they're, yeah. they're not like that. Yeah. You know, smack your book arms. I've had them and they beat me up before. So. Um, let's see. Okay, basically what you want to do, you want to pick, you know, you probably got, if I asked both you guys or Tom, you could give, I said, what's your uh, five favorite exercises? You're going to have them, right? But they're probably not going to be the same ones. And not the, your favorite, the ones you like to do, the ones that make you the strongest. So pick four or five or something, and that's what you want to rotate from. You know, uh, Coach Medvedev, the weighted coach, had 100 weightlifting uh, programs, but you couldn't use 100 of them. But, you know, you, you, you adapt four or five or six to your, the ones that work best for you, and that's the ones you work on. And that's what I've always done. So find out, it's better to make a five pound PR on something than a 30 pound PR. Normally a five pound to get your record to meet. Like the JM Press, if they went up, I got a bench record. You know, I've seen guys get enormous records on certain things, but it, it didn't make their bench goes up any. So then once you figure that out, just drop that. Just get, drop that's the rich stuff. Yeah. But I always like to do things that didn't really work away from the contest, just to, for boredom, mm -hmm. break the boredom. And, you know, I think that I remember when AJ was here, he said to me, well, if everyone did have their exercise, they rotate to, but if they had a bad day, they always had an exercise they've never done before. And they do that, and then that's a PR, so it's never a bad day. Mentally. Mentally. That's right. They'd always rotate, they always have something they've never done, and that's the, the use a day like that to bring it in. I haven't had a bad day since it has to be in the 70s. I learned to be smarter than the weights. Don't, don't just dive yourself into a bad workout. I trained a guy called Doug Heath. He was real strong, 114, 123. And Doug would invariably go in and, and he would get a record to try another weight and miss. And he'd get all crazy because he was crazy. And he goes, Lou, what, what's the problem? What am I going to do? I remember one time he went to high box squat, uh, like 475. He missed the damn thing seven times. Well, I'm waiting to go eat, you know. And I mean, this is like, it goes on for about an hour and a half. And, and he dump it every time. He had to reload it. And uh, so he finally makes it, but he says, how can I make my workouts better? And I said, easy, Doug, don't take that last weight. Just get the damn record and get out. I, I've, I've always, you hear me say, Tom, it sounds stupid. Kenny Patterson, one of the youngest world record holder ever, 20 years old, open. Um, him, and, him and the guys, they'd have a two and a half pound plate and they called it the plan. They put two and a half pound, they had a five, you know, a 500, 580 floor press. They put two and a half, don't do 585, they were done went in there and says the word. It was a plan. Break a record by five pounds and go on. And all the viewers out there saying, well, damn, five pounds. What's that going to do to my floor press? Well, if you did it once a month, it's 60 pounds in a year. And training gets a lot harder as it goes on. It's not going, in the beginning, everybody makes progress. In the end, it gets tough. Then you find out you got balls, and most of them don't, and they quit. So always steer your workouts towards success. But I'll never forget. I, to this day, I say the plan. Tommy, you see me. Mm -hmm. Like, what's that 580? You want to, I said, put 585 on. He benched it. Walk out of there, pause it, go to meet, and get a freaking record. You know, it's great to go that way. Once you start going that way, it's hard to get going that way again. Just, just be patient. It's not your last damn meet. So just get a small record in the gym and go on. And just keep getting that five pounds on everything. everything. I mean, these are, these are strong guys. I mean, George, I mean, Kenny's six and a quarter raw bench. George, six quarter raw bench. Um, Paul Key, six quarter raw bench. I mean, uh, uh, J.L. Hogan, six quarter raw. It goes on and on and on. These are strong ass guys. Why'd they put two and a half on there? Because it was a, they, it, it was the plan. They kept always making progress. All right? So, um, and then again, after all that, all that assist, the only difference is, you know, you, when you do all these, if you just did eight, you will say 25 lifts, Add up is a lot of volume. On max every day, you work up to max single as fast as you can and low reps. Don't go eight, six. Don't go eight, six, five, three, two, one. Warm up and go single, 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 single. Keep the work down. Get the record 100% plus. Intensity 100% plus, a new record. And then get in your assistance. And all this is we talked about before, it's repeated. Uh, somewhere or other, some type of, in some type of fashion, 
blow up your arms, blow up everything. You know, it's it's strength hyperpathy training. Do you do more or less based on the speed versus the max effort day? I believe you do this by day by day. However much you can do on that day, that's what you got to do. If you can do a lot, do a lot. You know, that's why I don't like programs. Everybody goes, well, Lou, you never you never say three sets of ten or four sets of eight or oh, hell. You might that might be a joke to you, and then someone else might kill the other guy. So you got to learn to do this by yourself. I only give you mathematics on the, on the weights, the volume you know, for your bench, what it should be. Uh, you know, the speed, we talk about speed a lot, about 0.8 meters per second and so forth. Uh, but when it comes to assistant exercise, that, you got to figure it out on your own. And the key is just constantly do more and more and more. You know, I, I bring up it's a weightlifter, but Leonard's as intensity, I talked about this many times, and in my weightlifting book, he was Olympic champion, 60, 64, world record holder, and all of a sudden he just tapered off and didn't go nowhere. And he, he didn't seem to have any emotional problems, and he had, had no injuries. So they got in his logbook in the Soviet Union, and they found out that the average weight he was lifting went down a little bit, and his volume went down. So they pushed it back, back up, and went right back breaking records. So, kind of like sums it up. That's a yeah. pretty important to remember your goddamn records. Oh. Remember your records. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. you're, you're a freaking nature. You can remember nobody's name, but you can remember everyone's records. Yeah. But some people here don't remember their records. We I make everybody have, write down it. You got it. Yeah. How the hell do you know you're getting better? Yeah. Yep. You're already guesstimating you're getting better and yeah. it doesn't and then, work out that yeah. well. You got a 10 pound PR and you're depressed because you think you did 10 pounds more. Yeah. Well, yeah, we got people that <laughs> they break a record every time because it's not a record. <laughs> <laughs> but that's about, listen, it, all these records are the important whole thing. Like, you know, we, we pretty much, we squat on a parallel box or, you know, close to it all the time or a low box. So you got to have records on these boxes. And if you got, if you wear gear, um, well, well, we're back in the squad, but if you've got a, a brief record, a brief and a suit record or so, we'll keep these records. If you're, you've got to break records. So what if we talk about the gear with the shirts, how often would you wear it and what would you do differently? Okay, yeah, you talk about meat prep here with shirts. A lot of people don't know this, but we wear a shirt about once a month. Now, uh, I think we've had six world record bench. We had Doug Heath at 32, Jay Fry and uh, Jason Cooker at 81, George Halbert, Kenny Passer, Rob Fusner. So we've had six world record holders. This is mean. Hoff is the biggest bench uh, for a full power lifter. Hoff's bench 1,005 in a full meet. So um, all these guys wear a shirt once a month. And the last time they'll put it, we do a circuit max squat 21 days out. That's on a Friday. The following Wednesday, they put a shirt on. All right? And, and then, 10 days out from the contest is the last thing hard we do, it's the floor press. And that's where we, we find out where we're going to be, uh, because if you break your floor press record, you're going to go break your bench record. And for everyone, when your elbows are on the ground, that's your sticking point. It, you know, me, it's right at my chest. A lot of guys got long arms up here, but that's where you're going. You know, if I get on my chest, I can grind it up. Guys, if, if that's where it is, it, it, that's your sticking point. It's just in, in a universal sticking point, if you don't cheat. Down, relax, bad, drive out. So it's like boss squad. Sit down, relax, drive out. Um, but um, any questions on that? And again, we work up with big jumps, get it over with. And I don't like, you know, everybody goes, Lou, you guys work up your openers. If I worried about my freaking opener, I wouldn't be going to a meet. We're going there to break records. That's why we kick everyone's ass, like it or not. <laughs> They're worried about opener. We're worried about PRs. You saw, Tom, you, what I say, Wesley, 580. And, and he goes in and does 585. Joe, 620, he does 660. Wait, hell with the openers. I'm not worried about, if I'm worried, I, I'm not even going to the contest. So if they're putting the shirt on once a month, every time once a month they're touching all the way to the shirt. What, uh, you guys go to power meets? What's the yeah. hardest freaking thing for a guy to do? Touch. Yeah, exactly. No one wants to do it. It's like a first date. The hardest thing to do is touch. So but you yes. got it. Try it. So you're saying yes, asshole. <laughs> You gotta touch your chest. <laughs> no one cares. I I two more this. I three more that. I won't. I don't give a damn. Cause in that meet, you gotta touch your chest. I wrote an article. I don't know if you read my stuff for years. I wrote an article about five of my guys. A couple of them world record holders. They, they started bench on one board all the time. I said, dude, you gotta go down you your chest. Lock it out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because you know, an inch of five eighths board. That's how short they came at the top. Yes, but it's an inch and five eighths that way, and mm -hmm. another inch and five eighths that way, mm -hmm. and all five five guys, good benchers, uh, got the weight up here and could not lock the freaking thing out. 
Just like I told him, I wrote an article about it. I talked about the definition of work and the definition of power and 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 Tom, they still do it. I watch a lot of people, you know, you may think I'm arrogant or you may think you may think I'm smart. People think I'm arrogant, people think I'm a moron. But I know one thing, I watch a lot of groups in one gym. I watch groups do things and fail. And I said, well, and, and I don't have no chumps here. These guys are all super strong. I said, I'm not doing that. It don't work. I watched this group do something that makes progress. I'm going, I'm going to do that. That's what I said. I had a 535 bench that's never going to lift again. And I blew my kneecap off and almost died. And I'm never going to lift. But the guy brought me out of retirement. Well, but meanwhile, when I trained Halbert and, and um, Jerry O and, and these guys, uh, uh, it was the third one, George, um, I got, like I said, three of a kind, no one no one could do that. I, I done what they did. I am smart enough to watch what works and freaking follow it. But then they get into trends. And I think a lot of people, uh, do, do, you know, I, I mean, you can do what you want. You know, if you ever read any of my stuff, I quote, how many scientists, Tom? 50 mm -hmm. or more. Mm -hmm. I take no credit for doing any of this except credit for being smart enough to do this. So everybody goes, ah, I know I'm smarter than Westside Marvel. I'll kick your ass. Well, you know, we don't sit very often. We go to pro meets with 25 guys in it, and we got we got 20. What the what the hell? You know, where are they at? If they are so damn smart, why aren't they there at these meets? And uh, but I, everything I do is is scientifically proven. It's data. Like I said, on a squad, 83 people. That squad at least eight, a couple 12s in there. Um, in the bench, it's almost the same. Like 80 guys in bench, a minimum of 600 in me. I think we could do it. If you got a gym that has no 600 pound benchers, your book has zero pages. My book has 80. So what's the chance that I will get 81 before you ever get one? Because right. I've experienced this over and over and over. And it's all you got is monkey see, monkey do. You know? Yeah, I agree. I was telling Tom that when I got here because he was telling me something that he learned to do with the belt squad from another gym. And I think that's the best thing about this place and you guys is that if you pay attention, you're rarely saying that I invented this or I came up with this. You're saying I learned this from so and so, and then I made it better by doing it day in and day out and figuring out a better way to do it. Well, Tommy, the other day, gets a bright idea to start working with the butterfly guard. Yeah. He goes down, takes a belt squat, lays them on her back, puts a uh, belt or, or bands around her feet, and holy crap! Yeah, we watched yeah, that. That was, that was vicious. You, there's always something to learn. <laughs> yeah. You know, how did I? Uh, our guys, we started getting these 900 pound deadlifts off the subject of bench pressing. But I believe we've done it in the bench too, right, Tommy? Isometrics. <laughs> I got to think about Paul Anderson. Every day, he'd go out, it, it, I'd leave his house, go outside, and do a hip lift with a 3,800 pound safe, 36, 38, every day. But this guy had hips stuck out to here. I mean, I, in my opinion, probably the strongest human that still ever lived. You know, this is in the 50s. And, I, and so I got to think one day, well, man, I could do that in that belt squat. So we got the belt squat, started building up weight. It took guys in seven, 700 depth to nine in 16 months. A 785 to 915 in eight months. Uh, 840 stuck for uh, uh, almost a year in 12 weeks to nine. And so then, uh, so what do we add to it? Joe, Joe, Simon Joe says, man, too bad we can't deadlift in here. Well, hell. So we put rat, we rails in ours and start deadlifting them. Things just shoot up even more. Constantly make things better. You got an idea, I'm using it. Yeah, I'll, I'll steal the knife from you and I'll cut your throat with it. Yeah. I think that's the only way to and get that, better. You can't get better if you think you're always right. Isn't that what Robin Hood did? No. Stole from the rich and gave to the poor. Oh, yeah. He didn't get away. Throws. <laughs> he should have. Probably did. Lou, do you do um, any push-ups for max effort? Uh, Tom, I love push-ups. You know, I mean, I'm too screwed up to do. But I did. We used years ago, we did complete push-up workouts. Uh, we did them with a bar in the bottom of the power rack, which is about six inches off. So you hold on to a bar, Bell, just like a bar. And a feet on the ground, we'd have record. I did 58 reps, 100 pound plate on my back. All right, I was, I was 220. And, uh, but we, uh, and my buddy did like 52 at 198, and we both had 500 pound roll bench. All right, and then, uh, but then you start elevating your feet. Larry Pacific did a lot of handstand push ups. And the higher your feet go, the blood runs into your upper body, and it's more arm and, and, and actually front and upper or delta no. So I, I love that. And, I, and for me, I did, my workouts was a push up workout. I didn't do anything else. Go do push ups. Tell me if your last heart is sore. And the key, when barbells weigh more than you, the concept that I use in a meet, when I press, I try to drive myself into, I try to drive myself away from the bar. 
But by doing that, it teaches me to use my back. When you do a push-up, you're pushing yourself away from the bar. So you're using all your muscles, not arm independently. You like to put a bar in the bottom of a power rack, too. I like, that's why I like to lay in the bottom of a power rack. It's about six, seven hundred. Remember, the higher your feet, it's more like an incline. It, you know, it's like you think it declined, but the blood's running all up in your upper body. And just, and I used to get off like this, you know. When I did like, a, you know, the 58 reps, 100, I mean, I'm prying my hands off this. Go to total exhaustion. When you do the repetition method, you have to go to failure. Only the reps, the light reps, the only ones working the very last ones. You know, you run a marathon, the first few miles ain't bad. It's the last mile, right? <laughs> Same thing. Do you like to do any drop sets after you max out? No, I don't believe in them. We go straight to the dumbbells. Uh, or, you know, just straight extension. But money, a couple set of dumbbells, and then they always go to the dance, they go to extensions, you know. I like the, I know you brought up the freak bar, but the, some of the specialty rehab design bars, we've got the freak bar and the bambell bar. Oh, yeah. Those two do, um, what impact do they play on the soft tissue? And developing that? Well, the band bar, you know, I originally used the broomstick, but I had shoulder replacement surgery. All right, the doctor, Dr. Benignacci, was with the Browns, and I was working with the Browns a couple of days a week, every two weeks. And he gave me no instructions to send me home because it was new at the time, and he wanted to see if this thing would hold. And so, but in one week, I started bench pressing. One week after surgery, I started to broom stick, touch my chest. Then I started adding bands to it. And what it does, it had a tremendous impact because in three months, I benched 300 pounds. Three months after having replacement surgery in my shoulder. And the vi we've never had a person come here to prove it, but I believe what it does, you did it this morning for your shoulder. Your therapist said you can't do nothing, but you did that, right? Well, she's not watching. Well, who cares? <laughs> you should learn something. And, but what I believe it does, it causes most maximum contractions of the soft tissue. And it's, it's a 50 rep bar. You do 50. You can do heavyweight. Our strongest guys do the most weight for 10. You know, but it's, uh, uh, anyhow, um, it, 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 it's got all these maximum contractions of soft tissue, so it makes you healthy. The more you do, the better you feel. Well, it's like you said, uh, stupid on my part is like the, I was, the tendon I was buying into the fact that the tendon but you have to do the high rep to get the blood to the tendon ligament tendon to have no to blood heal. that's right you tear a tendon it don't, it don't really bleed tear a muscle you know a small tear you get black and blue not a tendon or the deeper the tear it takes longer to come to surgery Lou uh, how often this is a question from Michael would you put pr uh, prowler training after max effort say after pressing or with the rope handles with Prowler for 20 yards, 100 yards. Basically, he's asking, would you do Prowler or any condition after upper body? I would never do, I would do very little Prowler. We don't do Prowler. I believe it takes more out of you than helps you, but we do a lot of sled work. Our guys do a lot of upper body sled work on bench day, a lot of lower body sled work on the other days. <laughs> a question from Luke. He detached his um, adductor longus squatting. Um, it's fucking with his head. Any ideas on combating the fear? Well, you can't be scared. That's a West Side saying. Don't be scared. But start back. You talk about uh, the le a leg injury, right? Mm -hmm. Start back on a high box with light weight. And just work up to, set yourself a goal, we'll say 500. Once you achieve that, start take, take an inch off the box. I don't care if you do it on a 20 inch box. Reach 500, take an inch out, make 500 or 19, then 18. Take it out slow but sure, gain your confidence. Success Luke. leads to confidence. Mm. Uh, should you feel your chest when you bench press? You're going to feel your chest, but not overly because you don't want to cheer. We see many. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, when Howard came here, he had chest like concrete blocks. He's always tearing his chest. And that's why I said, George, you have to make your arms stronger than your chest to fire him first. It only took about two years. And, and uh, we finally got to his head to stretch the bar to, uh, to activate the triceps all the way. Stretch the bar. And when he did that, no more chest injuries and George went on to break world records. So right. Well, just, we didn't really talk about that, but that used to happen a lot out here as much as pec tears from benching. Well, you don't see him here. So, yeah, so why, why don't you see him here? Because you press with your triceps. And, and we press in straight lines. If you're only able to train the bench once a week, is there any way you could, um, or how would you handle a training cycle for that? Once a week. I might 
alternate from um, with high reps like speed day and then max every next just alternate them because you're not going to get too far anyhow so <laughs> be honest with you but try listen anyone can surely take a band home and do those hundred tricep extensions at home put a band behind her back and do some push-ups at home um, you know all you college students out there in the dorm if you had bands it's easy to do a hundred leg curls a um, hundred good mornings a hundred push downs hundred push -downs. that's nothing you're talking if, if you just this two and then a, a couple hours later do two other things you're talking ten minutes dude and who ain't got ten minutes a couple times a day um, this guy tore his pec last November tears in the muscle belly with upper body and push-up work would it be best to use only dumbbells band work and incorporate the earthquake bar yeah, I would start back with the high repetition, uh, you know, the band bar, and um, I would go to, a, 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 if you haven't done it, ART therapist. We're getting ready to have a session as soon as the podcast is over, and uh, we have a very good one here, John Quint, and, and we live and die by John Quint. Um, he did, he tore his peck doing push-ups? No, he tore his peck. I mean, he's okay. one of can do push-ups. Yeah, do ultra high rep dumbbells. Like, I personally, um, I can't train real heavy more, but I've done 200 consecutive reps with 25 pound dumbbells. So just blow a lot of blood in it. And when you're doing them, slowly but surely start turning the elbow like I told you not to, but try to work the whole area that way. Um, what are the equations do you use in your training most frequently to assess progress from your recommended reading list? And um, would you implement Olympic lifts into GPP training? If so, what intensity is too much? So what's the question? What are the equations do you use in your training most frequently to you assess mean, progress? Do you, the equation to reach the I think weights we use? I think it's chart. And yeah, we use, yeah, we use Pelican's chart. And uh, is that what, about the lifts? I suggest you buy a book called The Manage and Training of the Weightlifter. It, and it, if you're doing Olympic lifts, and maybe you are an Olympic lifter, um, you need this book. This book is an outline on how to become a great Olympic weightlifter. There's one study on 780 of the highest skilled weightlifters in the old Soviet Union in Europe, and um, lots and lots of data. Premlin's data was as high as a thousand. Um, and, and Dr. Premlin, like I said before, was a junior um, um, national coach in Russia from 75 to 80, and senior from 80 to 85. He had some of the most, Yuri Vardanian was one of his lifters. And, uh, and uh, he had some of the greatest lifters that ever walked out of the Soviet Union. Why? Because he had a plan. Why did I do what I do? He did the plan, I followed his plan. Without a plan, you plan to fail. Olympic weight, late weightlifting, I trained Kevin Randleman for conditioning. I only used Olympic weightlifting. I used a, a power clean, then a hand clean, and a push jerk. And Kevin could do the, uh, 225 every 30 seconds for 10 minutes. There was rest at Ohio University, he used 300 pounds to do this exercise. I think it's a great conditioner. That's basically it. It's a, it there's nothing wrong with doing them. Power snatch, same way. Did you have a favorite training partner? I had tra uh, favorite training partners. I can't say I had a best because in the early days I had Bill Whitaker, Thomas Pellucci, uh, Gary Sanger. I mean, I had tremendous training partners. Doug Heath. Uh, everybody contributed. And you know, in the middle, you know, I had Vogelpohl, uh, Kenny Patterson, George Howard. I it goes Dave Tate. It goes on and on. I've always had. I've never. I put it this way, dude. I've never had a bad training partner because they get kicked out of the gym. If a, if a guy was a deadbeat, Chuck Vogelpohl would say to me, Lou, kick him out, get his key. And Chuck <laughs> was worse than any wife that you could have. And it was a lot better for me to go get the hell out than to put up a Chuck. So I would, but, but the thing about Chuck, if he was in my gym today, he was always right. He could sense if a guy was no good or not wanting to get it. You don't want to be the best and you're in the wrong place. But I've always had tremendous training partners. That, that Westside Barbell is not a product of Louis Simmons. Let's try it. The training uh, Westside Barbell is a product of probably a hundred uh, members of the Barbell Club over the years, always being free to experiment with me. Whatever dumb thing I want to do, they're ready to do it. Because, you know, so, most of them worked and they got progress and we went to another, 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 to this day. Is there a best time to use a sled? Uh, Any time's a good time. I, I like a lot of sled work. Heaviest on Monday. Uh, for, if you want to be strong, just go 60 yards at a time. If you want to be in condition, you can go up to a mile at a time. But um, heaviest on Monday and then moderate on Wednesday, 
and that will give you more strength endurance. And then I like to do sleds years ago when I squat on Friday. I'd use about two plates for three sets of 60 yards, um, six plate, yeah, two plates for 60 yards, six sets for a warm up before I was squat. Uh, I actually thought sled dragging made me stronger than weights. Why are you wearing a Lucha Underground t-shirt? I'm wearing this out of respect for a sexy star, my favorite wrestler in Lucha Underground. I've always wanted her to have a flying leg scissors on me, but so far it hasn't happened. <laughs> if you're out there sexy, I'm a big fan. <laughs> sexy star! Uh, any ha help on rehabbing uh, inguinal hernia? I don't think you can rehab a hernia. Uh, you know, many people get hernias operated on. Uh, it's a, it's a, I mean, I have, a, you know, my stomach six right, right here. I've had 20. What did the doctor say, Tommy? Somebody, my, my, somebody said my stomach's stronger than iron. And, uh, but a lot of people, I've seen this, it happened to my friends. They had their stomach operated on. They only put a, a single ply of mesh in and it tore back out. Now, Shaq uh, was here, John Shackerford, and I told him, he tore his out, and I said, "Get double, make the doctor do double." So the doctor agreed. He's never had a problem. He went from six seventy-five deadlift after doing major stomach operation to seven thirty-five. So if you're going to have it done, tell the doctor you're not normal. You're going to rip your freaking stomach out. My buddy to this day cannot lay on a hybrid because he had it done twice and he can't lay. He's got a hole in his stomach. Malpractice is, uh, you know, I think the third lady calls it death in America. We have two minutes left, but one last question. Um, Roger is having lower back pain issues at 60 years old and it's affecting his bench. Would the reverse hyper help for strength and stretching? Uh, yes, it will. That and try laying on a small med ball underneath your lower back, like a lot of guys get excessive arching. And, and Roger, I hope you're not one of them. Um, it doesn't do any good to get a tremendous stretch in your lower back. It, it matters how much arch you get in your upper back where the barbell lays. That's why you have a strong upper back. So if you're overarching, this actually put uh, a, a J.O. Hoagland out of powerlifting. It's one of the strongest guys I've ever had in my gym. Four meets, he had the fourth strongest total ever. And um, he had, at the time, he had the biggest bench in the gym. And But he did excessive arching on his lower back. We pretty much had to haul him back from uh, New Orleans from the senior nationals one year. So don't overarch, but train your abs. Put a small med ball about that big if it's on camera underneath your lower back. Practice laying out, uh, uh, lengthening out the psoas. Get an ART guy to work on your psoas. Your probably lower back problems go away, along with the reverse hypers. Okay. All right, this is the end of the Westside Barbell Podcast. I'd like to thank uh, Brian, uh, Anthony, and Louie. I'm Tom Barry, and this is the end of the podcast.